is click on view screen at the bottom of the website. Um, and you should see a slide up right now that says Oregon Electric Vehicle Rebate uh, and our logo. And third, we will be uh, taking questions at the end of the presentations. I think since there's lots of people on the call, the way we're gonna do that is use the chat tab on the right side of your screen to submit your questions. And we will monitor those and take them uh, at the end after the presentations. And if there are questions that do not get answered um, in the course of the discussion, please feel free to email us afterwards or give us a call afterwards. And we'll be happy to talk through those as well. So with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us. Um, this is a, just wanted to quickly run over the agenda for today's call. We're gonna do a quick welcome, um, talk a little bit about fourth, just for those of you who don't know us. And um, then we will hear from, uh, from Ruchi, the governor's energy policy advisor about the package overall and uh, how we got here. And then we will hand it over um, to, uh, to Jeanette and the rest of the team to talk through the details of the program, uh, what's in the legislation. And then we'll hear from DQ, uh, from Colin McConaughey about the um, actual implementation plans at DQ, to the extent those are um, uh, hashed out at this point. And then we'll take your questions uh, for about 20 minutes at the end, and we'll get you out of here on time. Um, so very briefly, just an introduction. I think most of you are familiar with Forth, but we were founded as Drive Oregon back in 2011. And uh, we really do four things to advance the electric and smart mobility industry. The first is industry development and networking. Some of you joined us at our roadmap conference uh, a few weeks back. The second is demonstration and pilot projects in range areas. Um, the third is consumer engagement. And if you have not already been by our showcase, I'd encourage you to stop by. It's down um, uh, between Salmon and Taylor at the World Trade Center, right around the corner from Electric Avenue. And in addition to that physical showroom, which is open six days a week, uh, we're doing a variety of ride and drive events and regional marketing campaign in the Pacific Northwest, um, which will provide a great opportunity to talk about these rebates with folks um, in the coming months. And then the fourth area, and really why we're here today, is policy advocacy. And there was a, uh, a fateful meeting in the summer of 2014 when a number of us got together and said, really, it's clear that the number one thing we need to do to advance this industry, advance electric vehicle sales. Oh, sorry, I'm pausing for a minute. I'm told we have to uh, do a technical fix here. One moment. All right, I think the slides are back online. You should see a slide with a beautiful picture of our showroom uh, down at World Trade Center. Sorry about that. So in any event, um, it was really clear that the number one thing that needed to be done to drive electric vehicle sales was to get a uh, some cash on the hood to get a rebate at the state level and a group of us convened in summer of 2014 to design that campaign and to launch that effort we made a good um, we brought on thorn run partners and uh, nels johnson from thorn run i believe is on the call we can talk a little bit about the uh the, the work that has been done in the legislature to get us today to this point. Uh, we made a good run at it in the 2015 session, learned a lot of lessons, uh, came back uh, tanned, rested and ready in the 2017 session. Uh, and here we are just three years later uh, with legislation passed. So we are thrilled. This is, as I said, a culmination of uh, three solid years of work on our part and uh, a lot of work by many of you on the call and others. Um, but we certainly could not have done it without the leadership of Governor uh, Kate Brown and from Ruchi on her staff. And so with that, I wanna hand it over to Ruchi to say a few words about um, how we got here today. And Ruchi, I think we've got you unmuted. Or we will in a moment. Yeah, and if Ruchi, if you could unmute your line.
Yeah, sorry, technical difficulties. Yes. Would you just have to, um, you need to click um, unmute on your computer. She's looking for it. <laughs> it's always embarrassing for a technology organization to have these problems, but bear with us for a moment. Should be in the upper right hand of your screen. There should be a microphone that's red. If you unmute it, I believe it turns to green. Okay. Bear with us here. Okay. All right, one moment. We're going to Can you hear me? We can hear you, Richie. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for having me on the line. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I swear I can't see the screen on your slide. So thanks for finding it for me. Um, I wanted to give just a brief um, sense of the process and the ultimate conclusion of the transportation package work that the governor led over the past 18 months. As many of you know, the um, transportation discussion has been ongoing for a number of years. I actually am not the person that works directly on it. My colleague, Carmen Four, uh, the transportation policy advisor, has put in a lot of work over the years to, um, to, to bring a package together that was addressing a number of needs in Oregon. The place that I came in to the discussion is because the governor articulated uh, one of her principles around the transportation package to be reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And as the energy policy advisor, I also work on climate change because 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Oregon come from the way that we use energy or the type of energy we use, and that includes transportation fuels. And so because of that inexorable link between energy and climate, the governor wanted to make sure that um, the transportation sector was doing its part in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the transportation sector makes up about 37% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Oregon, and that's through largely the combustion of fossil fuels in, in engines um, in our, you know, the cars that we all drive. And so there was a great focus on, on how to include greenhouse gas emission reduction in the package. Um, that uh, th there's a number of other policies that came up during the discussion, including our um, low carbon fuel standard, which is um, referred to as the clean fuel standard in the clean fuels program in, in the state, and also a discussion around public transit. Um, ultimately, over the course of session, um, you know, towards the waning days, there was um, interest in making adjustments to programs and um, supporting programs to fulfill that overall principle of greenhouse gas emission reduction. And so there were a couple of um, modest changes made to the clean fuels program that includes a credit cap on the amount that a clean fuels credit could be um, sold for, and that's $200. Um, in addition, the forecasting methodology and the clean fuel standard um, was put into the Office of Economic Analysis which may be a part of state government that you've never heard of, which is why I refer to this part of the change to be institutionalization of the clean fuels program. Um, and a couple of other changes within clean fuels that we think help to balance the need for greenhouse gas emission reduction with the need to make sure that um, costs around energy and, and gas prices remain stable. Um, the other piece I wanted to mention is around public transit. Um, as I understand it, this is the first time in Oregon's history that the uh, transportation funding package includes so many multimodal pieces to it and has statewide um, 
dedicated funding over a billion dollars for public transit. Um, Carmen had told all of us that when she traveled across the state to visit various communities, they heard the need for public transit uh, really loudly. It's different forms, of course, but it still was um, public transit that was desired in, in communities across the state. And so having statewide dedicated funding for that purpose was really important to the governor. And then finally, the reason we're all gathered here today is the EV rebate. Um, this, um, I think Jeff mentioned that, that, that uh, there was some effort around a bill during session that was specific to the EV rebate. And the piece that did not um, come together was what the funding source for the EV rebate would be. And so one part of the transportation package was um, the creation of a privilege and use tax, which um, essentially is a privilege and use tax on the businesses that actually sell the cars. Um, and so that is a 0.5% um, tax on sales that would be collected quarterly. And because of that new funding availability, we were able to um, take the good work that had been done during session on the separate EV rebate bill and insert it into the transportation package. Um, that, uh, that privilege tax will raise a certain amount of money per year and um, uh, $10 million of it would be uh, specifically used for the purposes of the EV rebate program. And so at the end of the day, we had a transportation package that had so many different elements to it and um, was able to garner the support of a supermajority to raise revenue in each chamber. And the governor has been very excited about the success for her, um, for her team and a, a priority that she had identified early on. Um, so that, that's the summary I wanted to provide. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Richie. Really appreciate all the governor's assistance and help uh, with the 2017 transportation package. And as mentioned, um, the governor has just done a phenomenal job in pulling this package together with the legislature. And as, as, as both Ruchi mentioned, the 5.3 billion transportation package, um, it was passed, so congrats again. And it was a broad pace package that did include 12 million each year for six years for the purchase or the lease of a new electric vehicle. And as Ruchi mentioned, it was the first time that this has been passed. So couldn't be better for the state to help with its greenhouse school gas emission goals. Um, the funding is going to be a 0.05% privilege tax on new cars, and it created two rebates, the basic rebate as well as the charge ahead rebate. And I know a number of folks have asked, well, who would actually be the program manager for those programs? And indeed would be the Department of Environmental Quality, or otherwise known as DEQ. And they do have the ability to and are authorized to contract with the third party to organize and design and manage the rebate program as well. In addition, and I know we've got a few questions thought it would be pertinent to mention at this point, the governor has not yet signed the bill. The governor does have 30 days from adjournment to sign the bill. The adjournment was July 10th. So the governor has until August 9th, and would you please correct me if I'm wrong, but has until August 9th to sign the bill. And once the bill is signed, it would then take effect 90 days after the signature date. And that appears to be approximately November 7th, which also happens to be potentially election day. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's any questions, we can certainly answer those towards the end as well. But with regard to the first program that it created, it was the basic rebate. And that is, has several components to it, which is highlighted here on the screen. Uh, we've been asked a number of times what is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. It is 50,000 or less. It is for a new vehicle, and that could be a vehicle that's on a dealership floor or as well as a test drive vehicle. And it must have at least a 24 minimum month term lease. It's either a battery electric vehicle or it could be a plug-in vehicle. And it must have at least 10 miles of the EPA rated all electric range, a warranty of 15 years, and 150,000 miles on emission control components. So there's technical elements to the bill. With regards to the rebate amount, it's 2,500 for vehicles that have a battery capacity that's above the 10 kilowatt hour. And for those that are below, it's $1,500 for those vehicles. 
The second program that was created that we're very excited about is the Charge Ahead Rebate Program. And again, this program will also be managed by DEQ. And the specifics for this program is listed here. Um, there's a number of them, including a household income requirement. If it's less or equal to 80% of the area medium income, that would be the low income, then it's going to be a low income household. If it's between 80 to 120% of the area medium income, that would be moderate income. And these are designated uh, categories by the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department, and it is tied to the closest metropolitan area in Oregon. Another requirement is that you, the individual must be living in an area that has elevated concentrations of air contaminants, which are commonly attributed to motor vehicle emissions. In order to uh, be eligible for a charge ahead rebate, uh, it would be mean the hiring or the scrapping of a gas powered vehicle, which must be 20 years old. And in order to receive the rebate, you must then replace the vehicle with a new or used electric vehicle. Now, the interesting component, too, about the charge ahead rebate is that you can possibly receive a $5,000 rebate if the replacement vehicle is new. So you'd receive $2,500 for the basic rebate and $2,500 for the charge ahead rebate. Some other provisions within the electric vehicle rebate portion of the 2017 transportation package bill was that the rebate for neighborhood, which we term low speed electric vehicles, and electric motorcycles are going to be authorized beginning of January 1st, 2019. And in addition, you'll we'll probably hear a little bit more from Colin, but DQ may reduce the rebates up to 50% or can suspend them for any vehicle category. They have that discretion depending on funding mechanisms, um, changes of vehicles and so forth. Uh, one area that uh, was also put into the bill is the higher registration fees, and that was for electric and hybrid cars. Uh, we were successful in getting that to begin after 2020, uh, which we lobbied uh, extensively on with uh, both our conservation group friends and other lobbyists, as well as uh, folks such as Nels Johnson, who's on the call. But that fee will be postponed till 2020. It did also include a higher MPG for higher MPG cars. It also included a fee, which will be approximately $100. In addition, uh, there is a potential uh, for a legal challenge to the overall transportation package. And we know uh, that is a potential. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nels Johnson, who will say just a few words about what the potential there is. Me? Okay. There you go, Nels. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, we expect there to be a challenge from AAA, um, in particular to the uh, the uh, the tax on new vehicles. Um, uh, I have not seen any of the briefing materials, but um, I believe that the state will have a strong case, and that we expect the uh, challenge to go down. Uh, one thing is that I also believe that this challenge will be uh, fast tracked. Uh, to the Supreme Court just to um, kind of to expedite the process, the appeals process, and get this done. So uh, I think we can expect that it's hopefully be wrapped up by the end of the calendar year, um, depending on whether folks, you know, file for extensions on motions and things like that. But I think that that's kind of in the ballpark of when we can expect this to hopefully be resolved once and for all and actually get to the um, implementation of the program. So with that, happy to answer any questions folks may have. Terrific, Nels. We'll go ahead and say a couple of questions towards the end. Great, thank you. I want to turn it over to Colin, who is with DEQ, and he is the Senior Climate Policy Advisor, and he's going to provide some information with regards to the program implementation and the management. Great, thanks, Jeanette. Can you hear me? We certainly can. Thank you, Colin. Okay, great. Um, so, I, DEQ, I should just begin with, uh, I think there's a lot of excitement uh, on, at our agency and on my team for this uh, rebate program, and, and we're certainly aware of a lot of the excitement uh, from the auto manufacturers, dealers, forth, and then many other stakeholders that have been uh, pushing to see this program, uh, a program like this, implemented. 
um, getting getting this program actually operational is going to be a multi-part effort uh, for, for my agency. Um, I know many folks are primarily interested uh, in when we'll actually have the rebate program operational and when purchasers of EVs will begin uh, being eligible for those rebates. And those two questions, uh, uh, when, when the program will actually be operational and cutting checks and when purchases of EVs will begin being eligible for rebates, those sound very similar, but I, we're, we're thinking actually that the answers may be quite different. Um, I think uh, currently uh, it looks to us as though the actual availability of funding in the new account that the bill establishes for DEQ, we don't uh, believe revenue will actually begin uh, uh, depositing money th there until well into next year. Uh, and the bill is quite clear that DEQ cannot issue rebates until we have funding in that account uh, to pay for those rebates. Uh, but, uh, and, and there's a ver variety of reasons for, for the, uh, that, the delay uh, that we anticipate there, and I can explain like, that, that if folks are, are interested. But for now, basically, that, that appears, the, the availability of funding appears to be the, the limiting factor as to when uh, rebates will actually uh, likely uh, be able to be issued. Um, but we know, of course, that uh, folks are keenly interested to uh, minimize the period in which purchasers of, of EVs are not eligible for these rebates that are now, um, I'm sure, increasingly uh, known on the street. Uh, and so we're hoping to uh, mitigate that by establishing a waitlist model. Uh, and that would allow purchasers of potentially eligible EVs to sign up basically for the ability to receive a rebate later once the funding is available and once our contractor is able to review those waitlist applicants for eligibility. Uh, we're still working out how this waitlist would work, when exactly it would come online, what information we'll ask folks to include when they sign up. Uh, but the plan right now is to establish this waitlist later this year uh, so that we minimize the period going forward when EV purchases are not eligible to receive rebates. Uh, there are a couple uh, other uh, elements, of course, to our process um, that we think will fit with, uh, comfortably uh, uh, within the schedule, uh, given the, again, that uh, date that we anticipate, uh, not a single date, but things are still quite fuzzy, but that period next year when we anticipate funding to be available. Moving backward from there, there's several other processes that will be underway. Uh, <clears throat> probably the first one, aside from potentially developing that waitlist, will be uh, the establishment of a rulemaking process where we will seek uh, our rules from our commission to uh, clarify or add some, some needed specificity in a few areas. Uh, the, the bill lays out quite, quite a lot of detail, so there, there's actually less that really needs to uh, go into the rules that then uh, is often the case, but nonetheless, there is a, a rulemaking process we'll have to go through. That, of course, has a, a prescribed public uh, involvement process, and we believe that uh, that actually will work nicely for uh, serving as a, as a venue uh, to receive a lot of stakeholder input and for us to solicit questions for uh, in a few of these areas where there is optionality for DEQ. Um, the another element uh, for us will be ultimately we'll, we'll uh, want to begin we'll begin a hiring process to hire uh, an FTE to uh, run this program, run the really actually run the contracting element and the auditing element that was also included in the bill. Um, be, and, and then the third element is this is the contracting piece for us, and, and we believe that that's the route we will pursue. Uh, there's an option for DEQ to do this in house, but I, I think it's pretty clear there's. Uh, firms out there that, that are already tooled up and do this type of program elsewhere so that the contracting uh, option makes a lot of sense, at least as we're looking at it right now. And so that will be another uh, process to get underway. Um, and just, I guess the final note here is that uh, the w contracting and the hiring are likely to um, be on hold until we know for sure that this revenue is going to be available for uh, for DEQ, and that, and that really gets to the uh, legal challenge that Nellis was just mentioning, that, uh, that the bill is quite specific, and that uh, in the event of, that, of such a challenge, the revenue collected from the privileged tax is frozen in an account, uh, and if the challenge is successful, uh, 
then that money gets rolled over, I believe, into the highway fund and, and would not be, of course, available to DEQ to pay for that contract or to pay for that FTE. So that's certainly something we need to see resolved, we, we believe, before we proceed on either of those paths. But I think that's our hope, anyway, is that that uh, resolves itself well before when the funding would actually, in the, as a practical matter, be available anyway uh, for us to begin uh, issuing rebates. So I, I'm certainly aware that uh, that's not all exactly what folks wanted to, want, want to hear as far as how this process will, be, will play out. Uh, I'm certainly open uh, uh, for questions and there will be uh, certainly, uh, as I mentioned already, some public meetings and, and stakeholder meetings that DEQ will run that we, uh, when we have uh, more details worked out and, and some more uh, solidity on how this, is, uh, on, on some of these dates and, and the timeline. Uh, so like I say, happy to, uh, answer any questions if folks have them. Thank you, Colm, very much appreciate that review. And uh, we're all hopeful that the legal challenge um, prevails for the state and for the transition package. With that, we are um, now at the portion of our webinar that we are able to answer question and answers, uh, provide answers to your questions. So. If you have any, we did have a few that were submitted, but if you'd like to type in some questions, um, we are monitoring those and we could answer them live here. I'll give you, give you folks a couple of minutes to go ahead and type some in and then I'll just go ahead and read a few of the questions that we had been um, submitted previous to the webinar. One, the first one being, <clears throat> I believe we answered this question was the program management, who would be responsible for the rebate program management? And that would be the Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ. And as Colin mentioned, and I mentioned, they do have the authorization to contract with the third party organization to design, manage the rebate programs. Uh, we've also been asked, how is this rebate going to be funded? It is funded with a 0.05% tax on new car sales with the privilege tax. Um, we've also been asked, um, going through the myriad of questions here, uh, let's see here, a couple of those we've answered. Yes, registration. We get, received a number of questions with regards to registration and the particular state individuals lived in. If an individual does not live in the state of Oregon, I, they may live in Washington, Idaho, California, since we did receive questions from those states, uh, could they still purchase an electric vehicle and still receive the rebate? And the answer to that would be no, the vehicle must be registered in Oregon. But we'd more than welcome, unless they drive, to welcome them to the great state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but request they not bring their cars. They just can purchase an electric vehicle in the state. Um, the question which we've also answered, but in case it was not, because I've received several, is there an MSRP cap with regards to the uh, bill? There indeed is, it's a $50,000 MSRP cap. Um, another question was, would I qualify to reduce my Oregon state taxes in 2018 if I buy the electric vehicle? No, this state is not a tax credit, it's a point of purchase credit. And it looks like we actually have received a few questions now. So I'll go back to um, asking and answering the questions that were pre-submitted. In the meantime, we received a question from Brett. Is the goal to accept consumers onto the wait list prior to resolution of the legal challenge? And Colin, if you're still available to answer, I believe we chatted about that and the answer was yes, but I'd like you to. Uh, yeah, I think I heard the question as, as would folks be able to sign up for the wait list uh, if the legal challenge is still playing out? And if yes, that is the the, the idea. In fact, is that that wait list would serve over in that period uh, when the rebates uh, could theoretically be issued, which is when the bill is, uh, I think, uh, 90 days after it's signed, so in October. Uh, that's potentially the earliest we believe that the wait list could be operational, and, and it would extend. Um, during that period when the, if, in the event that there's a legal challenge. So if I can take moderator's privilege here, Colin, not to put you on the spot, but the issue with then would be 
uh, you could start a wait list theoretically after 90 days, but if the uh, legal challenge goes against us, then the funding would not be able to issue rebates and DQ would not be able to issue rebates. So there would presumably have to be some disclaimer that that that's not a guarantee that people will get a rebate until and unless that funding is made available. Uh, yeah, Jeff, that's absolutely right. There's going to be a number of disclaimers here, uh, and that probably be the most important one. Uh, another being that you know we're not sur sure uh, uh, to make the waitlist uh, operational sooner. We're let, um, i.e., before we have gone through the rulemaking process, where our commission will prescribe more details as to the eligibility criteria. Um, having not gone through that, we won't officially know precisely what information to collect. Uh, for that eligibility determination. So that's another area where there's likely to be some disclaimers as to, you know, this is, uh, you know, some information we, we anticipate being required. You may be asked for additional information, um, and that would likely be coming from our contractor as they review those waitlist applicants. If there's additional information that we hadn't been collecting in the waitlist process, they'll need to collect it uh, later on uh, or submit it later on to, the, to that contractor, most likely uh, for, for that eligibility review. And while I have um, just to put a finer point on your earlier point, uh, my understanding is the earliest you would probably have actual cash in hand to pay rebates very earliest would be sometime in April and more likely uh, even further into next year. Is that correct? Yes, that's our understanding as well. That uh, Department of Revenue will not, the, the very first receipt of, of revenue uh, of that tax will come in April or April 1. Uh, is so that that is theoretically the earliest that we under, as we understand it, uh, revenue could come in. Uh, as you allude, there, there's it's likely to be later uh, due to some uh, some use of, of that initial disbursement of the tax on Department of Revenue's end to set up their the whole apparatus and that their agency to be collecting that this new tax. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like we had another. Um, specific question, very specific question come in uh, from someone who's expecting delivery of a Tesla Model 3 towards the end of the year, whether that will qualify um, to be placed on the wait list. And I think, um, uh, Colin, you want to take a stab at that? I think I think my answer would be maybe, but what, what are you thinking? Uh, <laughs> I assume it's less than 50,000. That would be the initial criteria, yeah. one of the easiest criteria to um, Check off, uh, but it would depend on when officially they were. Uh, I, I believe it would depend on when officially they purchased the vehicle. Uh, if, it, if that purchase was now or earlier, uh, I think likely not. Uh, the, the, I think that as we're thinking of it now, this wait list with folks, the EV purchasers who uh, begin to be eligible for this rebate would be in that October, October timeframe that you mentioned earlier, Jeff. I guess I would I would apply something for you to put as in program design is the definition of purchase. I would assume putting the deposit down does not constitute a purchase. That it's when you actually uh, assume title, um, and so if you have a wait list open at that time uh, for vehicles, then I would think that this person would qualify to be on that wait list. But um, yeah, there's obviously yeah. a couple, couple of ifs there. Um, yeah, that's the, a definition yes. that we, we would need to uh, clarify, and it's some, not something that we've explored. So I, I, I really can't answer the question with any uh, definition. But you're you're right. This is uh, the, the defining what what constitutes purchase will, will be an important one for us. This is probably a good time to mention that DQ has a website um, up on this program, um, and folks can sign up there for updates. Um, to hear directly from you as a, as the program is rolling out, and I think we have that URL um, on one of these slides. Whoops, back up. Yeah, so that URL is in the slide deck. We will share that with folks, and we'll certainly be um, updating folks through our newsletter um, as well. Do you want to take the next one? So we have another question. It's in reference to the charge rebate. What does retiring a vehicle mean as opposed to scrapping? I think um, again, this is one where 
that will be a good question for DEQ to sort out um, as uh, they develop the detailed program implementation guidance. Um, I know one of the topics that's been discussed is um, that really what matters for purposes of this program is rendering the engine inoperable um, and wanting to make sure that that um, engine is not running around out there. Other parts on the vehicle that can be salvaged. And so that um, that could be part of the distinction there is, you know, scrapping implies actually crushing the, the entire vehicle, whereas retiring is more like what was done during the uh, uh, cash for clumpers program and the stimulus where you drill holes in the engine block um, to render the engine inoperable. So I would say details to be determined, but that's sort of the scope of discussion there. <clears throat> And we do have a participant who's noted that tonight is the final <laughs> reveal of the Model 3. Uh, so stay tuned. I believe it's going to be at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard <laughs> Time in Fremont, California. Uh, so for those who are on a list for a deposit uh, to purchase one or just interested, please watch. Another question that came is, when does the 5% uh, privilege tax go into effect that will effectively cancel out the rebate? On a 50k vehicle. Um, well, just to uh, to check the math there, it's uh, my understanding is it's not five percent; it's a half of one percent. Uh, so it's not twenty five hundred dollar tax on a fifty thousand car; it'd be two hundred fifty dollar tax on a fifty thousand dollar car. Uh, but that goes into effect January one of twenty eighteen. Um, so, if you're going to buy a hundred thousand dollar car, you might want to do it before the end of the year. Um, you know, I would I would note that we did not uh, fourth did not support uh, that tax, but it is certainly lower than sales taxes on vehicles in Washington and a lot of other states. Um, so, for what that's worth, uh, other. Questions, Jeanette, that came in or they're coming out. Oh. Another question here too. Please explain yeah. the requirement in the charge ahead rebate that pertains to living in an area with poor air quality. The AQI numbers historically are very good across the state. Yeah, and I can start that and then call if you want to weigh in. Um, again, it's worth it is worth noting that you know compared to uh, some other states, Oregon has pretty good air quality, particularly for things like smog. Uh, but we have a lot of other uh, toxic air pollutants, and actually we have historically had a couple of air quality, um, what's euphemistically called air quality non-attainment areas, um, what other people might call polluted areas uh, in the state, in the metro area here in Portland and down in southern Oregon. The language in the bill talks about areas that are, um, get the exact language, but I think it's areas that are heavily impacted by pollutants typically associated with vehicles. Um, so again, that can be smog and hydrocarbons. It could also refer to um, NOx emissions and uh, toxics that come from gasoline or diesel exhaust. And uh, I believe that that will also be part of the program design that DEQ and their contractor will have to work through is um, how do they define uh, and choose those areas. Um, and I know that there's some maps showing some of that um, in the work that DEQ has done for the Volkswagen diesel um, plan. But Colin, do you have anything you wanna add on that point? Um, not, not specifically, you covered that pretty well, Jeff. Like you said, we are going to need to uh, figure out how we interpret that. Uh, but I think it would be to, to the under to the observation and the question that Oregon has clean air. I, I think generally that is the case. So we'd be doing this uh, kind of on a within the state relative basis of what areas have higher concentrations. Um, and as you also noted, Jeff, that historically there have been some areas uh, and, and still are in, in Oregon that have. Uh, pretty high levels of pollution that are associated with vehicles. So um, uh, we're certainly anticipating using existing data. This is not gonna, going to require, we don't believe anyway, a, a new study or effort on our part to put uh, reliance on existing information that DEQ has been collecting uh, for many years. So uh, we'll, more, more to, be, uh, to be determined there. 
Okay, we did have a request to display the DEQ URL again. And um, a couple other questions that had been submitted is, is the rebate retroactive? So if somebody had purchased a car either in 2015 or 2016 or very early in 2017, uh, would they be uh, available to receive the rebate? And um, they would not. It is not a retroactive rebate. The other additional question we received with, with regards to uh, motorcycles and scooters. And so does the rebate cover scooters or electric bike and electric tricycles? And it does not. Unfortunately, we were not able to include those rebates that we did um, attempt to do so in this bill. However, we do obviously support all forms of electromobility and we'll be looking to uh, the future and potentially opportunities to include those in additional rebate um, bills that come up. Uh, with regards to electric motorcycles and low speed neighborhood electric vehicles, um, they will receive a rebate and that will be January 1 of 2019. So there will be available rebates for electric motorcycles and neighborhood electric vehicles. And we have no additional questions at this time. Just a minute in case I want to add one quickly. So this is Jeff, while you're thinking about your last question, I will just, um, Point out that I don't expect this to be by any means the last conversation we have about this uh, program or about these rebates. Uh, I know that um, I appreciate DEQ in particular coming on this call so quickly after um, the bill's passage. I know there are still a lot of questions to be answered and we're working on those in the coming months. So we will make sure you're all on our mailing list. I would encourage you to sign up at the um, DEQ mailing list as well as we work through these design issues over the next uh, several months. And if you have other questions um, that were not answered on today's call, feel free to, to uh, direct them to Jeanette here and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. So looks like we do have one last one coming in before we sign off uh, about how much the electric motorcycle rebate would be. And Jeanette looking at each other because we don't have the bill in front of us. <laughs> Colin, while we frantically uh, Flip through this. I think it's. Uh, could you? Do you have that in front of you? <laughs> I do, just because I answered a question about this yesterday by email. Uh, I think it is anywhere between three hundred and seventy-five dollars and seven hundred and fifty dollars. Like all the yeah, other rebate I... structure, there's a minimum, maximum, you know, a range of two to one, uh, basically. So that's what I recall. That's what I recalled as well. So I just didn't want to guess and get it wrong. Um, and you know, again, like the other, like the other rebates, DQ has the authority to um, uh, drop categories if funding is limited, or to drop the level of the rebate by up to fifty percent um, if funding is limited. So uh, up to seven hundred and fifty. So stay tuned if you're thinking about an electric motorcycle. And again, I think with that, we will give you back yeah. ten or twelve minutes of your day. Yeah, just um, any to closing quickly, notes? Yeah, just want to quickly close and thank. Um, the governor for all her hard work, Ruchi, um, as well as our partners and uh, political lobbyist Thorne Rodnells and Dan, they've done a phenomenal job. DEQ, we look forward to working with you and thank you um, so much for your partnership, as well as our members and OEMs. Uh, we really appreciate BMW, Mercedes, Honda, GM coming up to assist with this legislation. Our environmental partners, OEC, OLCV, Climate Solutions, and Northwest Energy as well as our trade association and educational partners, TAO, AOI, Oregon Tech, and um, the many others who I did mention, but it was a terrific effort on everybody's part. We're very pleased and look forward to working with DEQ on implementing this program and defining such important issues such as the purchase of a vehicle. So thank you very much everyone for attending and look forward to future communications and uh, some newsletter information from us. Thank you.